real quick. Uh, if anybody's seen a pair of glasses, Diane, do we know the color or gray and black? They're, they're Diane, she left them downstairs. Has anybody seen some of those glasses? If you let Diane know, she will appreciate it. So, anybody seen a set of glasses? Nobody? They were downstairs. If anybody sees them by any chance, report it to Diane. She's looking for them. I think they work like a thousand dollars, so just kidding. All right, praise the Lord. Good to be in the Lord's house, best place to be. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice in it. Facebook friend, we welcome you also. Thank you for joining us. Turn to your hymn book. There should be a hymn book in front of you. Turn to page 402. And let's stand together. If you're able to stand, let's sing this wonderful song to the Lord. It's only two verses. It's a short one. Of page 402, our best. I, I love these hymns. I love the Bible. My number one book is the Bible, but my number, second book is the hymn book. It's an incredible hymn book, the way they put it together, and it's so, it's so much doctrine in there, so much uh, uplifting messages in there. And uh, it says our best, but I believe God wants more than our best. He wants our all. That's what I see in the scripture. God wants our all. Give your all to the Lord. Your all. So let's sing this together, page 402, Our Best. Hear ye the Master's call, give me thy best. For be it great or small, that is his test. second hymn this evening, which is number 246 in our songbooks, Redeemed. Hymn number 246 in our songbooks, Redeemed. In the Spanish, it would be 108, 108 in the Spanish, but for the English, it would be 246, Redeemed. Redeemed how I love to proclaim it Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed through His infinite mercy His child and forever I am Redeemed, redeemed Redeemed by the blood of the Lamb Redeemed, redeemed His child and forever my rapture can tell I know that the light of his presence 
with me doth continually dwell. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, his child and forever I am. I think of my blessed Redeemer, I think of him all the day long. I sing for I cannot be silent, his love is the theme of my song. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. I know I shall see in His beauty the King in whose law I delight, who lovingly guardeth my footsteps and giveth me songs in the night. Redeemed, redeemed, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Redeemed, redeemed, His child and forever I am. Amen. All right. Man, will you come? And it's good to see Jeannie. She's, uh, I think, second time visiting with us. She do not speak English, but she's pure, pure Spanish, and she's from where I was born, Puerto Rico. She's Boricua. Nice to see you, Jeannie. Thank you for being here. Make sure you greet her, welcome her. Um, let me mention about the uh, the Quiet State Sunday School Conference, and the theme is Yet Now Be Strong. This is the flyer, Yet Now Be Strong. That will be September 24, 2022, and that will be the guest preacher, Pastor Mike Mushler. And uh, by the way, the location is Sarifat. It's not far from here. It's on Sarifat, New Jersey. I believe it's exit 10 of the 287. Uh, so it is on right on Two Ministry Center Drive, Sarifat, New Jersey, and the time is 12 to 6 p.m. The conference is free. It's a, it's a very uplifting conference if you want to fellowship with other Christians, a lot of Baptist churches that believe like us. You'll be encouraged, you'll be challenged, and you'll be fed. You'll be fed, so I encourage you, if you're interested in going, that's a label for anyone that wants to go. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Let's ask the Lord to meet with us. Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for this time, Lord, that we set aside to worship you, to have church. All it takes is two or three to, be, to gather together in your name. And you're in the midst of us, Lord. And we need your presence. We, we cover your presence, Lord. We need you to minister to our hearts, Lord, through your spirit. I pray that uh, you will bless the offering, bless the giver. Lord, bless the message. Use me, use Carmen as you translate. Lord, empower us uh, as we deliver the message, dear God. And may you also, uh, uh, may we all be filled with the Spirit. If we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we could all be filled. So we get something out of it, Lord. Remove distraction. Lord, just speak directly to our heart. Give us what we need. Lord, faith come by hearing and hearing the word of God. May you do that tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise the Lord, let us stand, whoever is able, let us sing unto the Lord our third hymn this evening, which is number 324, Draw Me Nearer, 
hymn number 324 in our songbooks, Draw Me Nearer. turn in the word of God right now and please remain standing as we do that in honor to his word to the book of Philippians once again in chapter 2 Philippians chapter 2 looking at verses 25 through 30 for our text passage Philippians chapter 2 starting in verse 25 and on to verse 30. So there in the book of Philippians, in chapter 2, starting in verse 25, the word of God reads, Yet I supposed it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor, and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. For indeed he was sick, nigh unto death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I sent him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. 
Receive him, therefore, in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such in reputation, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life, to supply your lack of service toward me. Amen. Please be seated. You know, I was we're supposed to have Rocket Sunday today for the kids. And I was putting some effort, a couple hours trying to set up those rockets, you know, part of the instruction. I hate those instructions. Try to put it together, and there was one that I had, it was it was like years old, but it had other parts in it, and it took me a while to build in this rocket. It was almost the size of me. This thing was huge. And I was looking forward to see it go up in the air. This thing was big. And I praised the Lord. I was so blue, and I got it. I got, I got it. I put it together. I said, thank you, Lord. But then when I, I had three to shoot, and then the two small ones, then when I, when I, I said, well, there's something missing. And they, they, they bring engines. The engines are sold separately. And they don't say it in the box. That's deceiving. Why would you not put the engine? How are you going to shoot it without the engines? And, and nobody has it in stock. I checked Walmart everywhere. And, and I, so I ordered from Amazon. So we, we'll do it next week. But then I, I put it in the basement there, you know, the parsonage. And it was pretty. It was almost hitting the ceiling. That's how high it is. And I said, okay, I'll I check it out. I went back downstairs, and there was a nail in the, in the ceiling. And it just uh, it, 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 it shriveled up. I said, oh, no. All that hard work, I was depressed. But we still got the other little ones, you know. But anyway, uh, I, I want to I want to pick up what we left off this morning in Philippians chapter two, talking about following the right role models. And tonight we're going to talk about this morning we talk about Timothy. Tonight we're going to talk about Epaphroditus. He was a great man of God, a, 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 an incredible Christian, incredible. But the whole matter, he, by the way, he was a faithful servant. He was a loving servant. He was a Christ-like servant, and he, he gambled, risked his life for God, put his life on the line a, a risk for God. That's how much he loved the Lord. He was a great, you're going to see that he was an incredible man of God, Epaphroditus. But the whole matter of the Christian life and Christianity is this matter of following Christ and to become more like him. That's really the whole matter of the Christian life, this matter of following Christ and to become more like him. The whole Christian life is a process of pursuing Christ-likeness. That's why, the, that, that's why we, have, we have church. That's why we have preaching. That's what it's all about. It's to pursue Christ's likeness. When Jesus came into this earth and he chose his 12 main disciples, you know what he told them? Follow me. And they left everything and followed him. That's how it started. That's how it starts for us. And I think that's why too many fail in the Christian life because they, instead of following Christ, they start following man. And man will disappoint you. You need to follow Christ. I come from a church when I went to Bible college, and I went to Bible college, and I went to a big church. It was a Spanish church. Probably have maybe 3,000 people in there. It was a mega church. And the pastor, I look up to him. He was a great preacher. He inspired me. He was on fire for the Lord. He was a passionate, committed. He was committed to the Lord, but he got his eyes with the Lord. He got in the flesh and he fell into sin. He committed adultery with his secretary. And he broke us. And he got fired. He needed to get fired. And he disqualified himself from being a pastor. And he caused a church split. And from 3,000, there was only like maybe 30 people left. When I got there on a Sunday, it looked like a funeral like a funeral service. People were depressed. It was, it was so quiet. You could, you could drop a, 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 a pen on the floor. Everybody was depressed. Everybody left. They scattered. You know why? They didn't, you know why I stayed? Because I'm not following men. 
I follow Christ. And I knew that God would put another man behind that pulpit. He did. And I stayed there, man. I'm not, hey, I, I, we ought to have role models. The Bible talks about have role models. Paul talks about here. But make sure you, your, your, your main eyes are focused on Jesus Christ. And that's why too many fail, because instead of following Christ, they follow man. But when Jesus came into this earth, he chose 12 disciples, and he said, follow me. And that is what it's all about, following Christ, and to be more like him. The whole business of the Christian life is to pursue Christ's likeness. The Apostle John, by the way, it's, it's all over the Bible. There's stuff about Christ's likeness. It's all over the Bible. The Apostle John said that if you belong to Christ, he said that if you abide in Christ, then you are to walk as Christ walk. And this is in 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. 1 John 2, 6. Listen to what Apostle John says. He that saith, he that saith, he abided in him, out himself also, so to walk, even as he walked. In Galatians chapter 4, in verse 19, the Apostle Paul, writing to the Galatians, he said this in Galatians chapter 4, in verse 19. He says, my little children, he's acting like a father, because he was a father to them, a spiritual father. He led them to the Lord. He says, my little children on whom I travail, in birth again until Christ be formed in you. So Paul uses the analogy of a mother that goes through labor to deliver a full-term baby. And his analogy there is simple in Galatians 4.19. Even as a mother that goes through labor to deliver a full-term baby, he, Paul continued to labor over them until Christ is fully formed in them. So he's using this affectionate phrase to show the Apostle Paul's concern for their spiritual growth. To show the Apostle Paul's concern for their, for their growth in Christ's likeness. So Paul shows here his concern, his hard work and pain that he experienced on his part for his converts. And um, when his co convert failed to reach Christ's likeness, when his converts failed to reach spiritual maturity, Paul felt the pain like a mom going through labor and delivering a baby. And Paul is laboring and working hard to bring them to Christ's likeness. And that's what he's doing. And you know that moms, when you give birth and that labor, you know that you're concerned, praying that that baby will be healthy, right? And you show concern at birth, but you continue to show concern as that baby's growing, right? And, and, and because you want the best for that baby. That's, what, that's the, the thought here, Paul. He led them to cry, but I'm concerned. I want you to be mature. I want you to be like Christ. I want, I, I, he says, I, I'm going, he go, and, and it's, it's a painful experience when you, when you try to encourage people to live for the Lord and they don't listen. Just like our kids don't listen. It brings pain, right? Well, it's the same thing for the pastor doesn't have an easy ministry either. Because he deals with everybody's headaches. And especially when you give people advice and they don't listen. And I had give people advice and they don't listen. But that's what Paul, Paul is writing to the Corinthians. And he said a couple of times when he wrote to the church of Corinth, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, in verse 16, he says, And be followers of me. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he said, Be followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. You getting the idea? That's what it's all about. Christ likeness. Pursuing Christ likeness. So every time you come to the church and you're preaching, is the whole purpose is to for you to be more like Christ. For you to imitate Christ. God the Father says in Romans chapter 8, verse 29, he also, talking about God the Father, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. This is Paul speaking about God the Father. He wants to predestine us to be conformed to the image of his Son, to be like Christ. That's coming from God the Father. 
So Christ called us to be like him. God the Father called us to be like his son. John called us to be like Jesus. Paul called us to be like Jesus. And that has been God's purpose in the beginning of salvation, to be like Jesus Christ. The goal of every Christian should be to be like Jesus. And that's what we need to pursue, to be like Jesus. And if that's our goal, you're going to be a strong Christian. You're going to be a good role model for others to pattern their life after you. Look with me in Philippians chapter 3. I shared this verse this morning where the apostle Paul makes the contrast between good role models and bad role models because they are around us. And somebody is going to influence us and it better be the Bible, it better be Jesus. And um, Philippians chapter 3, in verse 13, the apostle Paul says, Brethren, I count not myself. If you look at Philippians 3.13, Brethren, I count, not, I count not myself to have apprehended. Well, watch what Paul said, but there's one thing I do. He says, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So I look at that and I say, what is the mark that you're pursuing, Paul? You talk about a mark here, you press towards the mark. What is the mark that you're pursuing, Paul? You talk about this price, this price. What is this price that you're pursuing, Paul? What is the mark? What is the price? You talk about a high calling of God. What is this high calling of God that you're pursuing, Paul? And I believe Paul will answer and say, Christ likeness. Christ likeness. Be like Christ is our goal, is our mark, is our price. I believe is the high calling of God. Because I believe that was Paul's goal to be like Christ. And my pursuing life, your pursuing life, it boils down to one thing to be like Christ. That's what it boils down to, to be like Christ. You said, Pastor, I thought our main thing was to glorify God. Yes, the more you glorify God, the more you be like Christ. You said, Pastor, I thought the main thing was to evangelize. To evangelize the lost. Yes, and the more you evangelize the lost, the more you be like Christ. Because the Son of Man came to seek and save that which was lost. That was why he came. That was his main passion, right? His all-consuming passion. And... Follow me and I will make you fishes of man. So the more you evangelize, the more you are like Christ. If our main purpose in life is to be like Christ, to pursue Christ like that, how is that going to happen? Well, there's three elements that we must have in order to pursue Christ likeness. Three elements. Three elements. That's, that's our pursuit, right? That's why I give you those verses. Because uh, God the Father wants us to be like Christ. Jesus wants us to be like Him. The Apostle Paul, John, they all tell us the same thing. That's our main goal, to be like Christ. So, if we're going to be like Christ, if that's our main pursuit and our main goal, how is it going to happen? Three elements we must have in order to pursue Christ's likeness. If we're going to become like Christ, we must... We have to know what Christ is like. And where do we know, where do we find and know what Christ is like? Very simple answer, right? Where do we go? There it is. We go to the Bible. We go to the Word of God because the Word of God reveals what Christ is like. And that's the reasons why Pastor Gary, for all those years, myself, after him, keep challenging you to read and study the Word of God daily, to learn more who Christ is, read it to defend the truth, the gospel, read it to defend the deity of Christ who's under attack. Brother Jerry, did you see all those Jehovah Witnesses out there yesterday? Oh, my soul, they're back. I was so happy that they didn't knock door for over a year and a half. 
I was so happy. Let, let, the, let, let the real Jehovah Witness like cut knock on doors. Amen? I mean, they were all over yesterday. I said, wow, they are all like, like, they were like, like roaches, like little, like ants. I mean, they were all over spreading the heresy. They're, they're, they're not, they're destroying the deity of Christ. They said that Jesus was created. He's Michael the archangel. And we need to defend that. We need to read the Bible to learn it so we could defend the gospel because they're preaching a false gospel. So we could defend the deity of Christ. Read it to answer people's questions. But I believe the main reason you have to read it is to learn Christ and live Christ and imitate Christ's likeness. The purpose of Bible reading is that the word of God the word of Christ can dwell in you richly and mold you into the image of Christ. That's the purpose, amen, to pursue Christ's likeness. We must go to the Bible to pursue Christ's likeness. We must, but that's the first element. If you want to really uh, pursue Christ's likeness, find out what Christ is like, go to the Bible. I'll tell them what Christ is like, amen. Here's the second element. First, you go to the Bible, the word of God. Number two, the second element, we must yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. The work of the Holy Spirit is to change us into the image of Christ. You know that? That is the main mission, the main task of the Holy Spirit that came into your life. When you got saved, what's the, what's the main mission of the Holy Spirit? To change you and me to the image of Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. I'm just going to read to you half of that verse because that verse tells us the main ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life and my life. And in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, it says, Our change into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. You know, John 14 and 15 talks about the Holy Spirit, His mission, His ministry, right? John 15, 26, it says that the Holy Spirit's mission, Jesus said, He testified of me. You go ahead and you yield to the Holy Spirit. You know what's going to happen? You know what's going to come out of your lip? You're going to be praising Jesus. You're going to be testifying of Jesus. That's a spirit-filled person. You're going to be testifying of Jesus because Jesus said that the main minister, he testified of me and in John 15 in verse 26. And in John 14 verse 26, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit's ministry is to bring to remember all things whatsoever I said unto you. So commitment to the reading of the Word of God and commitment to the yielding of the Holy Spirit's work in us will help us to be more like Christ. That's good stuff. Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 13, he says, this one thing I do. He says, I press towards the mark. The prize, the high calling of God. What is that, Paul? Christ likeness. Christ likeness. You, you know, you notice that you see Christ. It's like everything Paul's do is Christ. You notice that Christ is all over the Apostle Paul. Philippians one twenty one. For me to live is Christ, and to die. It's gain. So, in Christ, listen, in Christ is everything. In Christ is everything. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. In Christ is everything. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. Listen to this great verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 3. It shows you that in Christ is everything. If you got Christ, you're a blessed man. You are a blessed woman. You spoiled, rotten Christian. Amen. If you got Christ, you don't need nothing else. Amen. He's our sufficiency. Amen. We got everything in Christ. Because he's everything. Colossians 2, 3. Listen to this. Paul says in Colossians 2, 3, in whom, talk about Christ, are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Wow. The more I know about Christ, the more I know about true riches and true treasures, the more I know about true wisdom and true knowledge. All wisdom and all knowledge is found in Christ. Christ is the incarnation of truth. Christ is true freedom. 
You should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, right? Knowledge is the understanding of truth. Wisdom is the ability to apply what truth has been learned. Wisdom is seen and responding to life situation from God's truth. So, so to pursue Christ's likeness, we need three elements. We need God's word. We need the Holy Spirit working us. And then number three, here's the third element. This is what I'm preaching tonight. So I said number one, to, if our main pursuit is to be like Christ, we need three elements. Number one, we need God's word. That's what he's going to tell us what Christ is like, right? Number two, we need the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit's main job is to change us to the image of Christ. And number third element, we need to follow some Christ-like example. That's how you're going to pursue Christ's likeness. Word of God, Holy Spirit, and follow some Christ-like example. We need to follow the right kind of role models that follow Christ wholeheartedly. We got some in the Bible. We got some in the Bible. In Philippians chapter 3, in verse 17, in Philippians chapter 3, in verse 17, Paul says, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which will also, as you have also for an example. Follow me, Paul cried. He's the good godly example. And follow others who are good example too. And of course, Paul gives us three examples himself. I talked to you about Timothy and Epaphroditus. But then in verse 18, he talks about this bad role model that we need to avoid. Verse 18, for many walk in whom I have told you often, and I tell you even weeping, that they are enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, whose mind earthly thing. And these people, we need to avoid these people. They're not following Christ wholeheartedly. They're, follow they're self-centered. Their God is their belly. They live for the flesh. Me, myself, and I. And these are the ones that we need to avoid. These are bad role models. But here Paul tells us to emulate the right role models and avoid the wrong ones. And Paul gave us three Christ-like examples worthy of emulation. Paul himself is a good example. He said, follow me. Then we talked about this morning about Timothy, right? Timothy was uh, similar to the apostle Paul. I gave you those points. He was sympathetic. I mean, he really cared for people. He was single-minded. He was seeking only the interest of Christ. He was seasoned. He was tested and proven to be faithful. He was submissive. He was sacrificial. I mean, he was serviceable, greatly used for God, always available. And we talked about that this morning in that message. Now, tonight, we got another great example that we need to Look, 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 follow his example, and that's Epaphroditus. By the way, Paul, I believe, was the greatest Christian that ever lived. Paul was the greatest Christian that ever lived. He was the apostle Paul, right? And I think that maybe he's hard to imitate. You know, he's hard to imitate. He's, not, he's an apostle. There's something special. He's unique. Timothy was gifted. Timothy was called to preach and called to teach, and he was unique spiritually, call of God, set apart and trained under the great apostle Paul. He may be being hard to imitate. But Epaphroditus is someone like us. He's someone like us. He was not an apostle. He was not even an elder of a church. He was not a pastor or a, or a deacon. Or an evangelist or a missionary. I mean, he, he, was not, he, he, was, he was not a preacher of a church. He was a common man like you and I. Common man like you and I. Epaphroditus, the name means, you know what that, remember I told you, uh, 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 names in the Bible mean something. And Epaphroditus, the name means lovely or charming. That's what that name means. It means lovely or charming. He was a man who lived up his name. He was the man with a very kind heart. And you're going to see that. He was a man with a kind heart. His name was taken from the Greek goddess of love name, Aphrodite. And Aphrodite, she was a goddess of love, the Greek goddess of love and sexual attraction. There was a temple dedicated to her. And this temple dedicated to her owned slave prostitutes. And in fact, they said there was like a thousand prostitutes. And they all 
this has sexual perversion with this prostitute in the name of religion, in the name of this uh, false god. So that's how his name came out from Apophoritus. Apophoritus was a pagan. He was a heathen that came out of a pagan environment, but then he got converted. He got converted. Jesus changed his life. Jesus changed his life when Epaphrodite received the gospel. He was no longer belonging to Aphrodite. Now he's belonging to Jesus, and now that false God has no impact in him. Now the one that has impact in Epaphrodite is Jesus Christ. He was a changed man. Praise the Lord for the transforming power of the gospel. Amen. But I want, I want you to see here that Paul gives this great man of God this loving, charming man who had a kind heart, common man like you and I, he was not a teacher or an apostle, you know, we could imitate him. I know Paul is hard, Timothy's hard, but we could imitate a writers. And Paul gives him six titles, six titles that describe this special man that he was. Three of these titles are in relationship to Paul, and the other three titles are in relationship to the Philippian church. Well, let's look at these six titles that Apostle Paul gave this special man. Verse 25, look at it. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25, Paul says, I suppose, yeah, I suppose it's necessary to send to you a perforitis. That's the first title, my what? My brother. Paul makes it personal. He calls him my brother. He views Epaphroditus as my very personal brother. And then the brother there is in the sense of spiritual birth. They share common salvation in Jesus Christ. But also brother there is in the sense of common love. This term, my brother, refers to those who are members of the same family. It refers to those who are united, united in the bonds of affection and friendship. So Paul says, he's a brother love. I have affection for him. He's my friend, my brother in Christ. I love him, and I know he loves me. And um, by the way, we are in this thing, you know, we are in this thing of the Christian life together. We're not soloists. This is not a one-man show. We are in this together, amen? All of us are in this together. We are in the spiritual warfare together. And we should love one another and stand together. There's no place in the Christian family for one brother to attack another brother or another sister, amen? There's no place in the Christian life for division and strife. I'll chase those people out. If I see you as, you know, that's how the Bible tells you how to deal with a scorner. In the book of Proverbs, scorner is somebody who's divisive, critical spirit. And uh, you know what? Chase them right out. That's how, you, that's how you stop division and strife. Just chase them right out because the Bible says, cast out a scorning and strife shall cease. So there's, no, there's no place for that in the Christian life for division and strife. Jesus says in Mark chapter 3, verse 25, a house divided cannot stand. In Amos chapter 3, verse 3, it says, can two walk together except they be agreed? The Bible calls us brothers and sisters in Christ to love one another, to exhort one another, to encourage one another, to edify one another, to pray for one another, to bear each other's burdens. That's why we're here. There must be love and unity among God's children. And I see this unity here between these two men. This is my, my brother. I love him. We love each other. And that's how I had to be in God's house. Amen? I mean, there, there had to be love and unity among God's children. Unity and love for one another creates, I believe, a spiritual stability. You know, in Philippians chapter 4, in verse 1, the Apostle Paul begins that letter with this phrase, stand fast in the Lord. That's spiritual stability. Stand strong in the Lord. And then he shows some principles how to stand firm in the Lord. You know what it requires? It requires unity and love for one another. Because in that same context, there's two ladies that are causing strife and division in the church, and they were saved because even Paul says their names are written in the, in, the land, in, in the book of life. They were saved. 
But you know what? They had strife. They were not getting along. They were causing strife and division in the church of Philippi. And Paul sent a guy, strand them out. They need to be at the same mind. And this was the lady that was uh, Udius and Sintiq. They were causing this unity. And Paul said, hey, why don't you tell the lady to be in the same mind of the Lord, to have the same mind of the Lord? And, you know, the only way we can be strong, united church is to be of the same mind of the Lord. We, hey, that's, that's the only way we're going to get along, amen? Because if you use your own carnal mind, we're not going to get along. If you, if you put your carnal mind to action and everybody does that, we're going to have a lot of division in this church. But if you put, put on the mind of Christ, we have harmony, love, and unity. The Bible says in Philippians 2.5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know that the mind of Christ is available for you to use? You don't need to use your own corner mind. We have the mind of Christ available for us. Let us use it. Where is the mind of Christ? Right here. There it is. Put it on. And that's how we're going to have unity. Spiritual stability. That's how we're going to be strong in the Lord. We need to love each other. Not cause division and strife. Not tear each other down. And this is why the church of Jerusalem was so stable and spiritually growing. Let me read to you Acts 4.32. Because the church of Jerusalem was the mother church and it was growing. Something was happening in that church. It was bringing new converts in. And you know what it was? Unity. Harmony. They love that they have for one another. And it says in Acts 4.32. Let me read it to you. And the multitude of them that believe were of one heart and one soul. I mean, think about that. They were of one heart. That's unity. One soul. They were like one big brain with one heartbeat and one soul. They, that, that, that love and unity was bringing new converts in. That's amazing. That's amazing. John 13, 35, Jesus says, By this shall all men know that you are my disciple if you have love for one another. So stop looking down on your brother and encourage your brother. Pray for your brother. Love your brother. Amen. And Epaphroditus was united with Paul. He had the same mind of the Lord like Paul. He loved Paul and Paul loved him. He was not against Paul, but he was pulling for Paul. And Paul said, that's my brother. Amen. Amen. That's my brother. But here's the first title. So the first title he gave him, he said, he's my brother. He's my brother in Christ. Here's the second title. It's found in verse 25. Verse 25, he says, my brother and companion in labor. That's the second title. Companion in labor. Which means he was a fellow worker, a co-worker. He worked alongside of Paul in the Lord's work. And Paul commend him for his laboring effort in the Lord's work. You know, Epaphrodite loved to fellowship. But he didn't mind rolling up his sleeve and getting involved in physical work, doing the Lord's work. And I think we need some of that attitude today in God's house. This is where I think where we get out of balance. Many think that the church is only for fellowship, and that's it. We completed our duty to go to church. The fact is, God didn't save us to fellowship only. He saved us to get work for His glory. Amen? The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. You know, many times, we, fundamental Baptists, we like to blast it, hit hard about, hey, we're not saved by works. We're saved by grace, and we keep hammering that, amen? But it doesn't mean that we, 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 we can't just have a negative attitude about work. Yeah, we can't work our way to heaven, but now that we're saved, we ought to get busy working for the Lord. Amen? We ought to get, they, they, the Bible says faith without, in, in, in James chapter 2, verse 17, faith, if we have not work, is dead, James says. I will show thee my faith by my works. Talking about a saved person. Say, person is not saved by word, but you ought to be working for the Lord if you're safe. It's a shame that 90% of the church 
90% of the church work gets done by 10% of the people. That's what happened in churches. 90% of the church work gets done by 10% of the people. And there is plenty to do in the Lord's work, but a shortage of people are willing to do it. You know why? There are not too many companions in labor. This man was a companion in labor. This guy was a worker for the Lord. This guy was a worker. We work harder for a paycheck than from God's eternal work. And that's sad. Consider how much more we will, it will be accomplished for the kingdom of Christ if you and I work as hard in the ministry as you do for your paycheck. Think what we could get done. I mean, Jesus raised for the dead for us, right? Why can't we even we raise out of bed to come out to Sunday school? And you guys are in Sunday school. I'm not talking about you, you know. You guys are here. You're the cream of the crop. But I'm saying there's all the people that hear it, and I don't get it. Why would you want to grow more in Christ and be more like Christ? More preaching? It's not going to be harmful. It's going to be beneficial to you. He raised from the dead for you. Why can't you raise out of bed early? Amen. I mean, we ought to do that for him. A perfect writer put a tremendous effort in laboring in the Lord's work. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 30, look what it says about him. In Philippians 2, 30, it says, Because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death, not regarding his life. This guy, Brother Jerry, he burned out for Christ. He's an amazing man of God. Man. And by the way, he was not a pastor or an apostle. He was just a common man, a layman. But love the Lord. I mean, he, 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 this guy burned out for Christ. It says because of the work of Christ, it was because of the work that Epaphrodite came close to death, not regarding his life. The willingness to put the work of Christ first and his personal safety second show a lot about this man. He's a special man. This guy lived, Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ. This guy lived, Colossians 3.2, set your affections on the things above, not on the things on earth. This guy lived to lay up treasures in heaven, not on earth. What Jesus told us to do in Matthew chapter 6, verse 20. This guy lived, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. This guy lived there. He knew that the only thing that matters after you die is the work that you did for Christ. That is the only thing that matters when you die. Amen. The only thing we could take with us to heaven is the souls of our family, friends, and all those thousands of people that are waiting for us to tell them about Jesus. That's all that matters, amen? Souls, amen? That's the work of God that matters. But let me just say this. If your employer, we had to work hard for the Lord like this man. He was a hard worker. If your employer will evaluate your work ethic based on your work in Christ's ministry, will you be fired? Let me say that again. If your employer will evaluate your work ethic based, in your work, based on your work in, Christ, in, the, in Christ's ministry, will you be fired? What am I saying? Many times we work harder for the paycheck than the Lord's work. If so winning, let me say this, if so winning were your, were your job, Will you still be employed? You didn't hear that one. Let me say it again. If soul winning was your job, will you still be employed? It's quiet. Must be, the Holy Spirit must be stepping on toes. Amen? You know, there was a guy named Ironside. Ironside was a great man of God. And he shares a story. There was a group of believers who were gathered for fellowship, and they had little concern about reaching the lost. They had little concern about laboring in the Lord's work. And in front of the meeting that they had, they placed a sign, they hung a sign that said, Jesus only. But the wind blew away some of the first three letters of the sign that it read, us 
only. And you know, many times, it's not about us, my friend. It's about him. It's about working for him, amen? It's not about, it's not about working for us. It's not about our service, our own agenda. It's about him. It's about him. It's about working for him. And that's what this Epiphany was all about. It's not about him. It was about working for the Lord. It was about the Lord, about bringing honor and glory to the Lord. And he was such a great, a special man. But here's the third title that Paul gives him in verse 25. Look at it, Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. He says, a fellow soldier. You see that there, fellow soldier. This indicates that there were, that there were conflict in the ministry or Epaphroditus. He was a great soldier who did not flee in the face of great conflict and opposition. He was looking... He wasn't looking for a conflict-free or stress-free life. Why would he call him a fellow soldier? Because there was conflict. There was opposition. Paul said he's my fellow soldier. As a soldier, this guy gambled his life. This guy risked his life as a soldier. He had a great courage because he knew exactly what he was walking into. No question in his mind... I mean, this guy was a great soldier. He knew that was a, a risk, especially when you hang around the Apostle Paul. Because you know that the, the Roman government felt, you know how the Roman government felt about Paul. They said he was bringing heresy, this heresy of Christianity into the Roman world. And the Roman government was ready to execute Paul and his followers. So Epaphrodite, he gambled his life. He risked his life. He knew if they catch you with the Apostle Paul, the Roman government, they're going to execute you too. But he, he didn't regard his life. He didn't matter. He risked his life for the gospel of Christ, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul said he's my fellow soldier. He fights with me, with the real enemies, which is the world, the devil, and the flesh. He fights with me in the common battle. He doesn't stick a knife in my back when I'm away. He doesn't side with my enemy. He stands shoulder to shoulder with me, fighting real enemies, not fighting each other. By the way, we're supposed to be contending for the faith. That's what the book of Jude tells us. Anything that is going to destroy your faith, your commitment to Jesus Christ, your obedience to Christ, your relationship with Jesus Christ, Anything that hurts your prayer time, your Bible reading, your church attending, that's the enemy you must fight. That's the real enemies, amen? That's the real enemies. We need to take a stand together and fight together against sin and the evil and the wickedness of the world. Hey, let's become fellow soldiers with each other. Let's right, fight the real enemies. You know, the, the ones that are hindering your spiritual growth, your commitment to Christ. The, wh wh whatever is throwing cold water in your heart and trying to cold water the fire of God and the passion of Christ in your life. That's why you need to fight. That's why we need to fight. To stay close to the Lord, to be like Christ. So he was a fellow soldier. He was a fighter. He fought real enemies. But here's in verse 25, he gave one the fourth and fifth title but your messenger, you see there, and he that, and he that ministered to my want. Now, even though that his work, remember, he was not a pastor, he was not an apostle, he was not an evangelist, he was not a deacon, he was a messenger. But even though that his work was Mostly being a messenger, it was still the work of Christ. Hey, and no matter what work you do, whether you clean the church or, or uh, clean the bathrooms or, or helping with the grass or whatever work you do in the church, hey, that's the work of Christ. Amen. And do it realizing that that's the work of Christ and the most important work in the universe. Because it is the most important work. Now, what kind of messenger he was? Well, he was a faithful, caring messenger that took probably 700 to 800 miles journey to bring a financial gift to Paul in prison. It could have took him three weeks to do that. 
Paul worked for a living. Remember, he was a tent maker. Now he's in jail. Now he's not making any money. So now Epaphroditus brings an offering. They, they take a collection. The church of Philippi take a collection, and Epaphroditus will bring it to Paul in prison just to encourage him. In fact, I want you to go to Philippians chapter 4 for a minute. Go to Philippians chapter 4. I want you to look at verse 16. Philippians chapter 4. And look at verse 16. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse 16. It says here, Philippians chapter 4, verse 16. For even in Thessalonica you send once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all and abound. I am full, having received of who? Epaphroditus? The things which were sent from you, and this love gift, this financial gift, to God it was like a odor of sweet smell and sacrifice acceptable, well pleasing to God. And then he said, because you did that, my God has applied all your needs according to his riches by glory, by Christ Jesus. Now this guy got sick, but he kept going to supply the need. Sickness did not stop him. He kept going to supply the need. That's the kind of messengers that we need today in churches to go the extra mile in spite of difficulties, I mean, to minister to a needy person. That was, that was him. That's the kind of messenger we need in churches today. In spite of difficulty, because he was sick. He had a lot of hindrances, and he kept going. This guy had a heart for God. He had a heart for people. He was a messenger. He ministered to Paul's wants. And this is the kind of role model to follow. Paul gives him six titles that describe what a special person he was. Look at verse 29. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verse 29. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in. It says there, let me read it to you in verse 29. I want to read it correctly here. Philippians chapter 2, verse 29. He says, Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such. In reputation. So Paul said the church to esteem and honor the dear man of God. Hold him in, in such high reputation. This man had a gr great reputation. This was a real hero. This was a special man. A special man that this man, Paul says, he's my brother. He loves me and I love him. We don't attack each other. We pull for each other. We're united as brothers in Christ. Paul said he's my fellow soldier. He fights with me in the common battle. We fight the real enemies. We don't fight each other. He encouraged me when I'm in conflict, and I encourage him when he's in conflict. I mean, talk about a fellow soldier. My companion in labor, he works hard for the Lord. He's a hard worker. I mean, he's not working for things of the earth. He's setting treasures ahead. And Paul says he is a messenger. He ministers to my wants. He goes the extra mile to meet my needs. He's not self-centered. I mean, that's an amazing um, compliment that Paul gives about this great man of God, Epaphroditus. These are the real role models. But then here's the last title that the apostle Paul gives him. Look at verse 26. You know what he was? He was a burdened Christian. He was full of burdens. He ever been full of burdens? Well, he was full of burdens. He didn't have a stress-free life. Look at what he says in verse 26. For he longed after you all and was full of what? Heaviness. Because that you heard that he was being sick. For indeed he was sick night unto death. But God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be, that I may be, that I may be less sorrowful. Now, why was Epaphroditus was full of heaviness? Why was he full of heaviness? Not because of his sickness, 
even though that he was desperately ill, his focus was not on his illness. His focus was on his brothers and sisters in Philippi that heard he was sick and he became burdened because they were worried about him. And, you know, he couldn't stand that. He wanted to go back and let them know, hey, I'm okay. I'm okay. And Paul sent his back to clear his heaviness and the worries about him. So his burden was not his illness, but the welfare of others. By the way, that displayed Christ-likeness. This guy has some Christ-likeness. By the way, Jesus was in pain, right? Jesus was in pain and suffering, but he was thinking about you and I while he was suffering. So while this guy is suffering with pain, sick, he's thinking about those people. He said, I'm okay, don't worry about me. I want to make sure you're okay. And he brought joy to the life of others. We see him there. In verse 20, I say him, therefore, to more, the more carefully that when you see him again, you may rejoice that I may be less sorrowful. I mean, he brought joy to the life of others. He was an encourager. But here's a footnote on this man's bad illness. Here's a footnote. Sickness is not always the result of sin. Sickness is not always the result of sin. Here's a man who was sick. Because of working hard for Christ. Because of the work of Christ. This man was sick. Why didn't Paul hear Epaphroditus? Why he didn't heal him? Why did not Paul hear Epaphroditus? Paul had the apostolic sign of healing, the gift of healing. He had it. Why he didn't heal him? In Acts chapter 19, in verse 11 and 12, it said that God wrought special miracles by the hand of Paul. Paul healed many diseases. People came to Paul and he just touched them and diseases departed. That's in Acts chapter 19. He had the apostolic gift of healing. Why did he heal this poor man? Why? I mean, Apophrida was so sick, he almost died. Why didn't Paul heal him? I mean, if Paul was a faith healer, like too many faith healers today, don't you think he will heal him? Why he didn't heal Epaphrodite? By the way, why he didn't heal Timothy either? Timothy was sick in his stomach. He had, he had a, a, a problem with his stomach. He had a stomach trouble and Paul did not heal. He said, take a little medicine for your stomach's sake. He didn't heal him either. He didn't heal Epaphrodite. And in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 20, there was another guy named I don't know if I'm pronouncing that. Trophimus, whom Paul left sick. Here's another man that Paul left sick. Paul had his own physical weakness. He had a thorn in the flesh. Of course, God gave him grace to bear with it. Why did Paul, why he didn't heal a Pephorite or Timothy or this Trophimus or himself? I believe because Paul was the end of his ministry and the gift of healing had already passed. He was at the end of his ministry and the gift of healing had already passed. Instead, he prayed that God had mercy on him and God did answer his prayer. God did have mercy on Epaphroditus. And God had mercy on Paul too because Paul said, God, take care of my friend. And God took care of him and, and gave him mercy and strength. Amen? Look, it's not always God's plan to heal. Remember the pool of Bethesda? Remember that pool of Bethesda? How many people were sick there? There was a lot of people that were sick in that pool of Bethesda. Remember they had three porches? There was a lot of people sick there that every time God sent the angel of the Lord to stir up the water in the pool, the first person that see the water stir, that the angel stir, the first person that went in there got healed. A lot of people were sick there waiting to be healed. And waiting, sometimes they wait a long time, waiting for that water to be stirred. They stand there for an hour waiting for that word. And as soon as that word is stirred, some of them didn't have strength. Can somebody help me put in the water? No, I'm going in first. And a lot of people were healed. And guess who showed up to that pool of Bethesda? <laughs> and he healed everybody, right? Did he heal everybody? Did he have the power to heal everybody? So why didn't Jesus, because he don't care? Why did he, you know how many he healed? One. He healed one. You know what that tells me? It's not always God's will for God to remove 
your infirmity. Sometimes the infirmity came to stay. It came to stay in the Apostle Paul's life. It came to stay in the uh, life of Epaphroditus and even Timothy. He went to the grave with his stomach problems. So uh, I'm not going to burst your bubble. I'm not trying to discourage you. You need to pray for healing. But you know what? If God doesn't heal you, he said, I'll, gi I'll, leave, I'll leave the physical problem, but I'll give you my power. Amen, right? My power is made perfect in weakness. I'll take the power. Don't you rather struggle physically and have the power of God than to be healthy and not, not have the power of God? But we see here six titles that the apostle Paul gave this great man of God, this great role model, Epaphroditus. And let those six titles inspire us. Let's follow Epaphroditus' example. Not only Timothy, but Epaphroditus. What an incredible man of God he was. Common man like you and I. Just a common man like you and I. Not a teacher, and God used him mightily. Look, God wants to use us, amen? Why don't we follow these titles that this man of God had? Let's be the right kind of role models tonight. Stand on our feet. Let's be, people are watching us. People are watching us, and they hey, look. Jesus said, "Let your light so shine before man, that they may see your good work and glorify God the Father." Let's be the right kind of role model. People are watching us. And you heard the message. I say a lot tonight. Let's pursue Christ likeness. Let's pursue Christ likeness. That's what it's all about. And I believe there's three examples that God gave us in the book of Philippians chapter 2. Paul, Timothy, Epaphroditus. All these men were like Christ. And they're a good example for us. Let's follow their example.